This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with Martin Reeves, who is the chairman of the Henderson Institute at uh, the Boston Consulting Group, and also the author of uh, multiple books. Um, his most recent book is called The Imagination Machine, which I have here, an um, electronic copy, and also... Uh, your, your strategy needs a strategy. I should mention also that you're, you're co-author of The Imagination Machine with, with uh, Jack uh, Fuller. And, and I think this book is coming out soon. When, when is the, the book coming out? It's, uh, it's out on June the 1st. Okay, so it's coming out fairly soon. I, I, I got you right in time for the, uh, for the launch. Um, and so, you know, when you call this book The Imagination Machine, I know that you've been thinking about these issues for a long time, obviously, in, in both your uh, intellectual and, and career life. Um, but when you talk, you call this thing Imagination Machine, I think you're, you're trying to make the case that, because um, it, it, it seems a bit like an oxymoron, right? We think imagination and then we think machine. Machines are designed to do things that, that are very well uh, well thought through, very well organized, repeatable, scalable, and so forth. And imagination is this thing which is kind of, um, you know, more fuzzy and, and more loose, more unpredictable, more chaotic. And, and I think your your argument is that in order for companies to succeed in today's world, uh, they have to harness imagination and learn to kind of um, repeat and scale uh, imagination the way they've been repeating and scaling, say, you know, the, the manufacture of cars. Is that, is that a correct characterization of the of the choice yeah, of title? That's that's right, Craig. Um, so the, the 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 nuance of the title is that um, you know what's a machine? A machine is something which gets a, a job done. And you know what is the job to be done by business strategy today? Well, it's it's not to sustain long standing advantage. That would be nice, but we know that competitive advantage decays very rapidly. So it's to renew advantage. Renewal takes you into the creative part of strategy. Um, uh, imagination, uh, innovation, harnessing imagination. Um, so that's the job to be done. Now we may think of imagination as being uh, something which is uh, fickle and uh, individual and instantaneous and not capable of being managed, but that's rather strange. Actually, there are some reasons why we have this idea about imagination, but business doesn't shy away from measuring unpredictable, complex aspects of human affairs in general. We think about consumer psychology. We think about managing human resources. So this really is, um, if you like a playbook for harness, it's not really about imagination. It's about harnessing imagination mm -hmm. and harnessing imagination to reimagine corporations in the face of lots of external change. Well, when we think about strategy, sort of the traditional view of strategy, which, um, I think both of us were trained in, um, it's, it's really more thought of as, as a scientific exercise where you, you, you identify opportunities in a fairly systematic way, and then you exploit them according to a, to a formula that, that is, you know, provided to you by, you know, academics provided to you by, by consulting firms. Um, and strategy doesn't really play, play much of a, of a role in, in traditional, I mean, I'm sorry, imagination doesn't play much of a role in traditional, uh, strategy, but, but now we're, we're increasingly thinking in terms of ambidextrous organizations. Um, is this, has strategy, has the world of strategy had to reinvent itself in, in a world where competitive advantage, uh, disappears so rapidly? I think it's in the process of being reinvented. It takes a long time for the frameworks that we, we, we grew up with to be uh, supplanted by something else. But, um, there are many ways of, 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 of defining strategy, but, um, as a pragmatist, as a, as a practitioner, I define it as anything that gets the job done. What is the job to be done? It is through some sort of systematic pattern of thought or behavior to uh, achieve superior competitive outcomes. And um, historically, that has been equated with planning, though I don't dismiss planning as uh, planning and analysis as, as one approach to strategy. Uh, so my previous book, um, Your Strategy Needs a Strategy, deals with uh, the, the whole collection of different approaches to strategy and ask the question, what sort of strategy do we need in what sort of environment? And, uh, so we have the, the classical strategy, the planning based strategy, um, in fast moving environments, we have adaptive strategy, uh, which is, um, not competing on scale and efficiency and positioning, but competing on learning relative rate of learning. And then we have, um, visionary strategy, which is competing on creating new things being first 
Um, so an entrepreneur doesn't um, plot his position in the market because there is no market yet. He creates a, a market for something new. Um, and then we have um, strategies of ecosystems, which are collaborative strategies, where you figure out some mutually interesting value proposition for a group of firms to reshape an industry. And then while you might not think about it as a strategy, you also have a renewal strategy, which is uh, fixing um, uh, broken strategies, which often has to be done very rapidly and very pragmatically. And, um, but the, the stakes there are enormous. So it is, it is a strategic exercise in, in my opinion. So this, this new book, the imagination machine double clicks on the visionary strategy, the creative element of strategy, um, which is also the, um, if you think about it, the, re the remarkable property of companies to imagine something that doesn't exist, uh, which all founders of companies did, and then to cause that to become a new everyday reality. So it's essentially saying, what does that process work? And that is indeed underlined because in today's world, competitive advantage decays very rapidly. So it's not just the small companies that need to do that. You know, historically, uh, to generalize slightly, was there was the entrepreneurial companies, the startups that created new ways of doing things. And then if they were lucky enough to be successful and to scale, the main job of management was to optimize that yesterday's successful way of doing things. Uh, but I think that the big thing that's changed in strategy is that large companies now need to be entrepreneurial too, if they want to persist. Wasn't this idea of ambidextrous organization in some ways, um, it, doesn't it exist in utero in the old BCG uh, matrix, right? I mean, which was, you know, 30, 40, 50, actually it's probably 50 plus years old at this point. Um, yeah. So it's, um, uh, the, the classic portfolio matrix, um, which at one point was used by, you know, more than half of the fortune 500, um, was basically the idea that you needed to allocate resources in a balanced way across a portfolio of products at different stages of development. Um, so you needed to have, um, question marks, so things that may or may not pan out, but that, that's the, where your future option value comes from. And you need, um, you know, rising stars, um, uh, you need, you know, those business, some of those businesses to be growing. Um, eventually they become cash cows and, um, that pays for the new innovation activity. You need businesses that are performing the fund ones that will perform. And then of course, some businesses go over the hill and become dogs, in which case you need to pull cash out of them because uh, that will otherwise prevent you from funding new businesses. So that is, um, uh, if you like a resource allocation approach to the life cycle of ideas and businesses. Uh, what it didn't do really though, was to go inside the, it peeked inside people's heads, the, you know, the, the, the mental processes associated with innovation and the conceptualization of, uh, of, of innovation. Uh, and he didn't really deal with the organizational aspect of how do you progress something as tenuous as, as a, uh, a speculative idea through to being, uh, an optimized scaled reality. And then to repeat that process. So, so the, the, the book really go, delves more into the mental dimension and the, uh, organizational dimension. So nowadays when I think about strategy, I, I don't only think about the, the strategizing, the traditional strategizing parts of the process. I think about the strategy stack. I think about the entire suite of organizational, psychological, financial, and strategic tools to, to get the job done in total. Yeah. And I think, uh, in, in this book, you talk a lot about not just ambidextrous organizations, but kind of ambidextrous mentality or the ambidextrous, um, uh, viewpoint that people have to have within the organization. And we're going to get to that in a bit, but, but, um, when we think about imagination, does it make sense to think of it as kind of a, a resource, uh, and capability of, of a firm uh, that, that is either tapped into or not tapped into, or is it simply about recruiting and retaining people who have, uh, imagination? Uh, and then once you get them in the organization, the, the organization will, will, will somehow, you know, um, become more imaginative. Well, we, well, one of the things we have to do in the book was to look at the, um, the history of imagination and what, um, the philosophy and the, the arts, um, had to say about it. We also had to look at computer science based because of course we're redrawing the cognitive boundaries between what humans do and what computers do, uh, as well as the, the business perspective. And we came across a number of, um, myths, if you like, of imagination that get in the way of seeing what needs to be done clearly. And one of those myths is that imagination is a magical process that can't, uh, can't be managed. 
And we reinforce that when we tell Steve Jobs stories and we heroic stories about individuals, um, they, because implicitly we're implying that, you know, it, it's not a systematic capability in an organization. It's a magical property of a very small minority of individuals. And then a related myth to that is that imagination is mainly an individual affair. It's, 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 it's Steve Jobs. Um, but, um, you know, actually we think that imagination is, needs to be both individual and collective in order to be scaled and, 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 and harnessed. And that to some extent, uh, as much as any other unpredictable aspect of human affairs, it, it, it can be, uh, scaled and, uh, and, and, and harnessed. Well, maybe, maybe we should, we should put, put some teeth on, on, on what imagination is. is. And, and I think you, you, you emphasize the, the, the idea that uh, imagination, imagination is thinking about what is not. In other words, not, not just simply thinking about what is, but what is not. not. And, and, then and then engaging in some counterfactual um, mental exercises to, to think about what, what the world could be. Uh, and, then uh, and then ultimately the organization is capable of, of, of taking, taking things from, from the way they are to the way they potentially could be. That's right. And so as we go into the nuts and bolts here, um, just let me quickly introduce another consideration in the book, which is this, this cognitive boundaries being redrawn between machines and humans mm. aspect. So we're, we're also thinking, um, uh, you know, what will the machines replace and what will the machines not be able to replace and where do we focus the human cognition in the strategy process? Um, but indeed, um, uh, what we're talking about here is a style of thinking, which, um, which is uh, counterfactual thinking, which is thinking about things that are not the case. Um, so the, the, the mathematician Judea Pearl distinguishes three types of uh, cognition. I think it's a useful distinction. Um, he, he talks about correlative thinking, um, which is, you know, if, if, if this happens, what else happens? So if I buy donuts, what else happens? I also buy coffee. So machine learning is in many, many applications is already much better than um, expert human beings in, in figuring out those, uh, those correlations. And then we have causal thinking, which is, you know, which comes first, the coffee or the donuts? Do I buy coffee because I buy donuts or the other way around? And, um, machine learning may eventually, um, be able to make that a tractable problem, but the, the, the history of, um, statistics is such that the machine learning that we currently have isn't, isn't particularly good at that. So for the time being, that's, uh, a more human domain. Um, but the one that, um, is beyond the reach of machine learning currently and tremendously important in uh, creating new things is counterfactual thinking, thinking about things that could be the case that are not yet the case, which is essentially the entrepreneurial way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And this is important because of course, entrepreneurs do this all the time. Um, but large companies, um, under the guise of, uh, practicality, um, or efficiency, um, stress this less and less over time. So ironically, although every company was founded on an act of imagination, that capacity for imagination or reimagination, um, or, or you could say more financially, the capacity to generate, to generate future growth option value tends to decay over time. So we know that for example, the, the growth potential of companies declines, um, by about, um, 3%, uh, percentage points for every doubling of size and for every doubling of the age of a company. So that's the gravity that we're trying to defy here. So, and you talk about mental models and I want to get into that, but, but I guess the, the temptation would be to think at this point, well, okay, if I have a, um, an ambidextrous organization and I have, you know, one part of the organization that's doing all the exploitation and I've got another part that's, that's doing the, um, the exploring, um, I, I can just, uh, put the exploitation business, uh, in the hands of the, the robots, right. And, and let them, you know, rinse, wash, repeat that aspect of the business. Uh, and then I can devote most of my, my human carbon-based thinking to the, the, the explore side of the equation. I, I'm, is it, would, would that be, uh, would that be an erroneous, <laughs> to, to some extent, I mean, um, so one, one of the major questions of the book is, um, what should the humans focus on? And, um, you know, we should focus on, uh, things where we have a unique advantage that can't be done more efficiently some other way. And, um, so one of them is counterfactual thinking. I think another is, um, anything to do with human empathy. Um, we're a social species and we, uh, prefer to interact with, um, uh, with, with, with humans. Now we can, um, simulate to some extent, um, interacting with a human, but, um, you know, there'll always be sort of high touch service businesses where 
a human is much better at dealing with the the quirks and the unpredictabilities and the you know the empathetic aspect of an interaction. But there are many others too. For instance, algorithmic governance um, is is um, uh, is is uh, you know what should be. It's more of a moral mm-hmm. question. What should the uh, machine learning be doing, and how frequently should it be updated, and uh, and, and what's moral, and so on. These these sorts of questions. Um, the the architecting of the imagination machine itself, you know, design problems, uh, just that is, to some extent is still very uh, human uh, human problems. And then the purpose of the organization, you know, after all, you know, what is the point of business? It's to it's to further human ends. What human ends? Um, well, we, we you know we get we get to decide that. Um, so this may sound a little uh, a little abstract, but there are there are businesses out there. Um, you know, like Google and uh, like um, Recruiter, we talk about a lot in the book. Mm-hmm. That is seriously thinking about reconceiving the organization as some sort of synergistic combination of machine cognition and human con- cognition that changes everything. I mean, it changes our construct of an organization. So it becomes less, you know, uh, a structured hierarchy of people relatively doing stable tasks with reporting and control relationships um, to, you know, that plus more dynamism plus synergy with. Uh, with with AI, with new governance, um, the communication uh, procedures wrapped around it all. So when I think about innovation, I think about kind of incremental innovation, which is kind of innovation around the edges, and then you know some kind of transformative innovation. And, and it seems that in order to do the the first, um, you need causal reasoning. I mean, you have to you have to figure out what kind of experiments to run, uh, and and it's not clear that. Artificial intelligence is at the stage where it's capable of, you know, generating those experiments. I mean, perhaps there you could design a, a some kind of um, some kind of system which would automate the experimentation process, but but that would only presumably only help you with the incremental innovation, right? It, it's hard to imagine AI designing the kinds of uh, uh, inquiries that would help you to to do something that's non incremental. I think actually um, all all imagination and innovation is grounded on causal reasoning. Um, uh, we we may have the uh, loose loose idea that um, imagination is qualitatively different from um, and maybe even opposed to um, causal thinking. Um, but if you think about it, the imagination is not fantasy. Uh, fantasy is um, uh, unconstrained counterfactual thinking. Um, constrained kind of actual thinking is constrained by the logical structures of the world, the, uh, by, 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 by causal reasoning. We want to imagine things that do not exist, but which could exist, um, as opposed to imagining things, uh, which could not exist because they're, they're not compatible with, um, with what we know about, you know, economics and, 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 and physics and so on. Um, so it's all grounded in, um, uh, in, 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 in causality. And, and I think you 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 argue that this is something which is uniquely human. The, this this capacity. It, it is. So um, I'm uh, originally a, uh, a biologist, and um, you know I've looked at the uh, the evolutionary um, aspects of the imagination and cognition, and um, some animals to some extent have aspects of of, of, of counterfactual reasoning. A, a chimpanzee can reason about uh, uses of tools. Um, uh, that um, that it hasn't explored yet. Um, uh, if those tools were in its visual fields, so in a very limited way, they have a sort of imagination. Um, but our ability to, um, to to actually say, well, you know, I have a mental model of reality based on the laws of of, of, of physics, and um, and I construct alternative realities and choose which ones to bring about. That's 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 uniquely human uh, versus other species, and also. Um, versus the best that we have of, um, of, of machine learning. We do explore the question in uh, one of the later chapters of, will there ever be such a thing as artificial imagination? And we explore the relationship between, uh, and we ask questions like, you know, can machines help us to imagine better? Um, but for the time being, it's, it is uh, somewhat uniquely human. I've interviewed a number of biologists, all of whom have emphasized different aspects of what makes us human, and, and some have emphasized um, our uh, propensity to collaborate. Others have emphasized our theory of mind. Others have emphasized language. Others have have emphasized uh, our capacity for reason. And I think um, you double down on this counterfactual uh, thinking, but there's other aspects to it, in particular, the ability to think analogously and to do kind of um, 
transfer learning across different domains. And so you, you encourage uh, people to explore insights from, uh, from multiple domains uh, in order to do these analogous uh, inferences. We have, um, we have uh, six steps that any organization needs to master to, to be able to systematically harness imagination. And the first one we call the seduction. Um, mm -hmm. the, the seduction step is, is when we choose to focus on a possibility that doesn't exist. And um, looking at both the science of imagination and also um, any case that is in business, um, it seems that the, this is all about surprise. We have no need to update our mental model unless they encounter a surprise. And the surprise comes in, in sort of three flavors. Um, you know, one of them is, is, is accidents, which is we're trying to do this other thing and this thing happened. And when we took a closer look at it, it, it you know, suggested new possibilities, accidents. Um, uh, and another one is uh, anomalies, which is generally this happens, but in this case, this other thing happened. Um, and uh, a lot of businesses pay, a lot of very entrepreneurial businesses pay attention to anomalies. Uh, the outliers are not the, the thing to be ignored, they're the thing to be focused on because that, that's where the seeds of future option value is. And then another one indeed is, is analogies. You know, what is this like? And if this happened over there, why not? Uh, why, why, why not over here? So we, um, in, in the entrepreneurial stories that we uh, investigated, we looked at how um, uh, individuals had, um, and generally the first step is at an individual level, um, uh, how people embraced analogies, accidents, and anomalies. Mm -hmm. And you also, in each of these chapters, talk about some of the obstacles to, to this. And it seems like most people are uncomfortable with, with, uh, with surprise. Um, I mean, you'd think they should, you'd think they would enjoy it. I mean... You know, dopamine. You get some dopamine when you see a surprise, but but most people you are get dopamine. You 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 get some some cortisone too. You know, it um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's this, it's. I mean, it requires cognitive effort to to focus on the outliers and not just the averages. I mean, the averages is this marvelously just just the idea of an arithmetic mean or or a median is 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 a wonderful um, um, compression mechanism. It enables us to focus on you know one thing rather than five hundred things. But we do lose the signal value of the anomalies if we do that. So there's the cognitive effort. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is, um, I think, you know, fear of the unknown. Um, obviously, our explanation, the 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 the, uh, the depth of the, the explanation to our boss about the anomaly, the thing which isn't fully worked out yet, is always going to be more shallow than the than say the deeper, more rational explanation. Um, there is just curiosity. I mean, just uh, you know, are you even? Are you even looking or seeing what you, what is in your visual, uh, what is in your visual field? Um, I think there is, um, so we, we say it boils down to two things really. One of them is, um, is, is, uh, uh is, is seeing, um, uh, so large organizations, for example, are extremely, uh, in general, uh, extremely introverted. Um, an organization is like a sphere, the surface area to volume ratio decreases the bigger the sphere gets. And so by default, organizations become more and more inward looking. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to make a special effort to even see the anomalous signals that you should be adapting to. And for the whole organization to see that, because if one person on the edge of the organization says, I can see this thing that completely undermines our current way of doing business, and nobody else can see that, um, you know, you've got a social translation problem. And then the other one is, is, is caring. Um, so all the entrepreneurs we spoke to either had a, a, a deep frustration with the status quo, or they ha had some uh, image of an ideal, so they, you know, something that could be better, even though nobody was, no, cust no, no customer was explicitly asking for it. So those are some of the, uh, obstacles and, um, secrets to, to this, uh, seduction step. So I had someone come and speak in my, uh, in my data science class and, and she was describing how um a lot of companies when they're building out their machine learning models they just you know acquire data indiscriminately uh, and so most of that data doesn't really tell them anything that they didn't already know and and you if you're if you're more selective then you can conserve your energy and and uh seek out those those um bits of training data that will ultimately help you to ref refine your decision making um and and it's always been surprising to me that companies don't have a more conscious and intentional strategy for acquiring information that they would need in order to improve their Well, some their, do. Their I mean, some understand that um, upstream of innovation, we have imagination. Imagination is triggered by um, the contact with otherness. 
you know, things that don't fit our current mental models or current ways of doing things. And some organizations explicitly seek out that otherness. I have um, uh, a, a, a Harvard Business Review article, co- review article coming out in a, uh, in a couple of weeks' time on uh, the art of what I call anomaly hunting. Some, some companies go out and look for the, for not trends, you know, trends is a change in the world that has a name and everybody's looking at and not speculation, you know, things that could be the case for which there's no evidence, but they, there are, there are a number of companies, um, we get the example of a company called Brooks Automation, for example, that explicitly went out looking for, uh, new ways of deploying their capabilities and looking for the weak signals that others hadn't yet picked up. So in a way they're hunting anomalies, they are pursuing, um, uh, the adjacent possible they're they're looking for signals of the suggest that there may be some substance, some, some, some reason, some evidence to, to think about, um, building their business in a different way as that's, but as you're, uh, you are right in saying that that's not mainly what market research or strategy does. You know, I, I used to teach a statistics class alongside a colleague of mine who was teaching the design thinking class. And it was funny cause I, I'm a humanist teaching stats and she's a engineer teaching, uh, design thinking. And, um, we used, she used to always joke that, uh, in stats, you're always looking for the pattern and in design thinking, you're always looking for the, for the violations of, of the pattern. Um, I, I don't think that's quite true, but, but that's, that's, uh, you, you need to have both, right? The same truth in that. Absolutely. So we, 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 um, talk, talk about it as, uh, thinking like a novelist, you know, the, the details actually matter. If you're looking for, um, the, the poignant anomalies that will hint at new ways of doing things. Um, the average won't tell you much. The average will just, um, uh, even in the case where the world is shifting to a new set of needs or possibilities, uh, the average will only, uh, change, change very slowly. So you really need to look at the, uh, look at the particular. So the, the, the idea of a, analogous thinking is fascinating to me. Um, I remember my first involvement with, with BCG was 25 years ago or so, or 20 years ago. And a bunch of consultants came to University of Virginia where I was, and, and um, we had the weekend where they would learn about, you know, biology and, and game theory and all this stuff, which was, um, you know, very abstract and academic. And, and I remember when I, when I would teach this material, the consultants that came would, would start running away with it. And they would take these, these models and they would say, Oh, well, this could mean this. And this could mean that. And I was like, no, 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 you wait, you, you're, you're violating the assumptions. Uh, wait, you know, that's not how it works. And, and then I realized like, that's actually a good thing that, that they're, they're deviating from the, the, the parameters of the, of the strict academic formal, formal model. They're, they're exploring and looking for insight that's inspired by the, these models without necessarily being, you know, strict, uh, illustrations of the model. That's right. We, um, so, so I run a part of BCG called the Henderson Institute, as you said, and, um, you know, we're, we're in the business of hunting down, um, new ideas that businesses will need, um, in the, uh, in, in the future. And, uh, we have a fellows program and one of our, I think you're referring to one of our fellows, Tia Mon Gitsi, who, um, some years ago wrote a piece, um, in Help Business Review called the, um, the fruitful flaws of metaphors. And, mm-hmm. you know, essentially this was all about pushing metaphors, um, into the, the space of the unknown, the unexplored and, and, and seeing where they break down and using that, you know, why is that a useful thing to do? Because we're often prisoners of our own mental models. We often mistake our mental models for facts. And it's hard to see that unless you either break your mental model or go outside your mental model. And one strategy for doing that, um, is, um, analogous thinking and, um, or metaphorical thinking. Um, another strategy of doing that is to have multiple mental models. You know, if, if I know, um, how physics works, how, um, you know, how romantic novel plots work, um, uh, how biology works, I, I can adopt an adaptive view of things, a learning based view of things, a mechanical view of things, a, a complex systems view of things. And, uh, there'll be many, um, dead ends of course, but, um, uh, but as I say, you know, thinking is for free. The mental exploration part of this is, um, is, is, is not expensive. People confuse the expense and time of an experiment of a physical experimentation process with, uh, the, the, the mental exploration process. So one of the things that the company needs to do is to, um, free up its mental exploration process and, 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 and stop labeling that sort of activity as, you know, wasteful, unevidenced, impractical, 
uh, because that's that's where that's where imagination begins. One of the the techniques I've found over the years. I mean, I basically I'm a professional strategist. So I've been doing business strategy for thirty years. One of my frustrations over the years has been that you can take the right questions, the right people, the right resources, the right amount of time, frame a strategy process around them, and mysteriously come out with some minor variant of the strategy that you went in, into the process with. And and uh, after after some years, it, it it struck me that this was because of the difficulty of challenging our mental models and seeing them as that. So in the book, we have a number of um, managerial games which are explicitly designed to expose our models as models, to expose alternative models, um, to, uh, within the context of the game, break our unspoken assumptions, um, uh, which we may treat as facts, and, and then to to toy with alternative assumptions, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, a very good place to start a strategy process. I so I, I used to call those pre-strategy games. They're very good at freeing up the thinking before you enter a strategy process. I think you, you talked about Thomas Aquinas and, and, uh, the, the idea of, uh, you know, his, his, uh, skill at exploring completely alternative models. And, and you mentioned the mental model, I don't know whether, I don't think Thomas Aquinas would use this terminology, but, but you referred to a mental model as a, um, a sort of a, a controlled hallucination. Um, yes. I mean, it's very important that we, that we don't see our mental models as facts. Um, so for example, here are some things that sound like facts, you know, I'm, I'm in the consulting industry and we have such and such a market share and the growth rate is 3%. I mean, it sounds very factual. It sounds very objective, but I'm in the consulting industry. I mind them. I, am I in the media industry? Am, mm -hmm. am I in the technology industry? Um, these are all you know, valid alternative points of view mm -hmm. that would lead to different conclusions. And if I can't even, uh, you know, and if the industry that I'm part of is not a, not a fact, then things like market share, of course, like market share turns from being an apparently objective number into something that depends upon, you know, how you look at it. And, um, so, so it's, um, this is, this is the second step we're talking about here, which is work, working the idea. I think there's an art to working the idea, which is essentially being aware of mental models as mental models, mm -hmm. being aware of the components and assumptions of our mental models, um, having some sort of process of recombining those, uh, recombining those elements and a process for maintaining coherence of vision across, across the different elements. Um, that is, uh, the detail of the, you know, the, the artisanal part of counterfactual thinking. Now, I don't think in general, we get, we get taught very much how to, um, how to think in that way in, in schools and, um, and it, and in business schools and the corporate cultures often reinforce that with the pursuit of efficiency and practicality and the speed, you know, we are working tremendously hard, um, in this, uh, in, in, in this country and we, we don't often even allow time, uh, for this sort of more reflective, uh, exploratory thinking. So I think it's very important to, to reclaim that space at the beginning of the process. Well, how do you even convince people that they should do this? Um, you know, I've worked, I've done a lot of corporate workshops where I'll sit down with a bunch of executives from a manufacturing company and I'll say something like, okay, what would it be like if your company was, what would it look like for your company to be a software company? Right. And, you know, and, and these, this is going to be an incredibly fruitful exercise. Just, just, just to completely put the, or you know, what, what if your employees were your customers, what would that look like? And, and that, that's a great, great question, Greg. Um, uh, but I think you're, you're, the way that you framed the question was precisely right, which is how do you get people to care about that question? Mm -hmm. Um, because especially a successful company, one that's uh, current profits and growth are not too bad. Um, there may be no sense of urgency to explore that question, uh, in which case the best you can do is, um, uh, you know, appeal to some sort of sense of curiosity. So urgency really helps and they mm. have real urgency, uh, which, which helps. Um, so a, uh, you know, a threat is, is, it is a great thing from that perspective because it focuses people on the existential and the alternative. It also dispels the, the baseline fallacy. The baseline fallacy is the idea that because I have been successful, the default is that I can continue to be successful. It's often not the case if you're threatened with disruption. Um, the, the urgency can be there, but, but hidden, you know, you may not be able to see the disruptor from another industry that is about to attack your industry. So that's exposing that gives you that sense of urgency. And then of course you have the art of the artificial crisis. We found many leaders of large companies that reinvented their companies had, you know, in a very deliberate way said, we, we you know, we need to get develop a sense of urgency around here. And they did that in a number of ways. The, 
I think the most common one is to listen very carefully to the customers. And the, the trick there is not to listen, it comes back to averages. The trick there is not to listen to the average view of the customer, because if you ask a very narrow question to an average customer, then, you know, most companies will tell you that their, their average customer is generally very happy with, with the product they're receiving. Um, instead, you need to focus on uh, the bad customers. And that's one of the games in the book. Um, you need to focus on who's defecting, who's never a customer, who's the dissatisfied customer, because that's where you're, that there's the information value there is, uh, is, um, is, is potentially higher. You can also do the same thing, sense of urgency around what I call the maverick game in the book. The maverick game says, um, look, there's a bunch of companies out there in any industry and, um, that are taking a bet against our business model. They're, they're taking a bet on something which isn't my business model. And the game is to essentially say, well, the hardest question is the first one, which is, well, what is my business model? Let me articulate what I believe about how this business works is. And then the second step is to say, well, what do they believe about how business works is? Well, you know, what is their alternative model that they are backing? And the third one is, is, is the interesting question. It says, um, don't ask if it's good or bad, because how would you know, you know, how would you know you're you're mentally invested in, and you've been trained in. And you think only about your current business model. So if you think it's a bad business model, is it genu genuinely bad or is it just merely unfamiliar and uh, uh, unfamiliar to you? So instead, uh, we suggest the technique of uh, best case, which is you make the best case for the business model and you assume that they were correct. And you look at the consequences for your business and predicated on the assumption that they are correct. Um, you actually then ask, um, you stand back and you say, well, what should be our stance towards this? And not inevitability, this, 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 this possibility. And in the process, what you find is that you relax current mental models, you encourage exploration of others, and you eventually, end, you eventually end up with, um, what you wanted to do was, which is to, to, to adopt this, this, uh, this, this, this broader view. But that's a very important, uh, very important thing because as, as they say, success is toxic. The success trap is, is, uh, is alive and kicking. There are lots of very big profitable companies out there that have very high market share that are quite vulnerable. And, and so the, you know, one of the key roles of leadership here is to create that sense of urgency and that, uh, perpetuation of, of curiosity. So in some of my other, uh, folks I've spoken to, they talk about kind of the, the curse of, uh, kind of NPV thinking and the kind of curse of ROI thinking. I mean, it, it's to, to set aside a whole big chunk of time for reflection, to set aside a bunch of time for, um, counterfactual thinking. As you suggest, as you, as you recommend, you know, put your phone down, walk around, you know, put it in your calendar, put it in your schedule. Um, th this is something that's very, very difficult to justify when, when companies are short on time, short on manpower, right? You know, there's even, even when things are urgent. It's difficult to mentioned. justify for, yeah, it's difficult to justify if you judge the, the merit of things in terms of efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. your input out, your instantaneous input output ratio, your productivity will, uh, will, will not be enhanced by reflecting on things that could be the case or might be the case. Um, however, it's inevitable that if you don't think about those things at all, you know, there's a 100% probability that, uh, at some point your business will be obsolete. The, tr the trouble with waiting uh, for when you need, uh, this, this thinking is this generally too late. So we've done some work, um, it was incorporated a little bit in the book, but it's mainly published separately on the the value of preemptive self-disruption. And what we found was that, um, it was quite rare for companies to the successful companies to turn themselves around preemptively to mm -hmm. preemptively self-disrupt. Um, but essentially that every, every minute counted. In other words, we, um, theoretically there could be a, a limit to preemption, right? Which is if I disturb successful things too much, I could actually theoretically destroy value. Um, in practice, we found that the the problem was very, very, very much biased in the opposite direction in that most companies left it too late and therefore risked big, um, big, uh, step change, uh, turnarounds. And we know that those turnarounds took fail 75% of the time and every month of preemption um, actually improved the, uh, the results and, and the probability of, of attaining a, 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 a successful result. So. You know, is that, uh, is that inefficient? Yes, it's inefficient in the short run, but in the longer run, it, it is, um, it is essential. But you also have some, some comments in the book on, uh, the role of the parasympathetic nervous system and, and how stress can, um, oftentimes get in the way of people thinking creatively, but, um, 
you know, when you have a sense of urgency, I mean, one would think that you would be able to do kind of more reflective, creative, counterfactual thinking, you know, bef before the urgency kicks in. And when the urgency kicks in and anxiety takes over, then it, it makes it even more difficult for you to, uh, yeah, yes, that's right. I mean, too much, um, so, you know, we suggest a bunch of things in the book to help companies to Im improve their ability to harness imagination. And uh, probably the simplest recipe for, uh, for killing all of that is, um, is too much fear and no time. Um, so too much urgency. Um, I think too much, um, you know, tepid water is, 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 is a different type of problem. Uh, like no, no need, no rational need to explore other things. No sense of urgency at all is, uh, is toxic. Um, and, um, sometimes that's the, the arrogance or the complacency of large corporations, but equally, um, something where there is a pressure to enhance productivity right now, um, or solve a problem right now, um, to give a very mechanical description of it, um, too much, uh, too much tactical urgency can also crowd out the, the sort of thing. So you're looking for some sort of, uh, happy optimum that can at least part of the organization. Now, in terms of, of gaining inspiration, uncovering new information and enhancing your, your counterfactual reasoning, you, you talk about, um, creating a learning journey for, for people within the organization. Um, and, and how much of this learning journey needs to be, uh, kind of structured and how much of it needs to leave room for, for serendipity? Is there, is there a way to have kind of planned serendipity? Is there a way to organize a learning journey that maximizes the, the exposure to potential surprises? How do you, and is this something that you should think of as part of the kind of learning and development of the organization? Is, is there a, a role for a, a, a formal, um, mandate around learning? Well, this goes back to the theme of, um, the whole reinvention of the construct of organization. So, um, one, one key aspect of organization is, um, you know, is qualification and competence and learning and, um, and you probably feel this in your job of, um, you know, teaching MBA students, which is. The old model is that you, uh, you learn at the beginning of your career mm -hmm. and what you learn is knowledge. Uh, and then the rest of your career, you, you trade on that knowledge and that's not a bad thing. Um, but it makes them one huge assumption, which is that, uh, the knowledge will continue to be relevant. And of course, um, that's especially anything to do with technology. That's just not the case. Um, so what you really want is, um, a shift to, to more continuous learning. And, uh, also given what I've said about the decay of competitive advantage, um, also more, um, uh, more deployment of creative capabilities than knowledge-based learning. Um, uh, in other words, the, the, the knowledge that we need to, to reinvent a company is not something we can look up in, in any textbook, even a, even a recent one. It's, it's deploying the, the capability of, um, of learning new things. Um, so in, in business view, we, we, we've had for a long time, the learning curve. You know, as I build volatile, uh, as I build cumulative volume and cumulative experience, my costs tend to decline. Be be a major pioneer in that area, um, but we now need a different type of learning curve, which is the ability to learn new things. So I talk about competing on the rate of learning, and that's what I mean. So, what are the nuts and bolts of that? I think it is you know number one, hiring people for their learning potential. So you're judging people by their learning potential, not by what they, not by what they currently know. Um, you're also in, in a sense looking for, um, contrarian learning, you know, because the most valuable learnings will be the perhaps where their new learnings are likely to disagree, their propensity to, um, to entertain alternative mental models and go against, um, a conventional wisdom. You need some of, uh, you need some of that in the organization. This needs to happen continuously. And since it's not entirely planable, we don't know what it is that we'll need to learn to reinvent the company. Indeed, we need to be open to serendipity. But I think the first step, the first massive step in openness to serendipity, um, is, is just the basic physics of allow time to do that, um, show culturally that, that that's a good thing and have people exposed to, um, the, the signals that they need to, um, adapt to or, uh, or, or, or harness, in other words, be externally facing, um, so if, if success is the first enemy of imagination and success and complacency, I think the second one is this introversion that comes with scale and success in large companies. So you, you mentioned hire people that have certain attributes. Um, you actually, I think in the book, go through in, in some detail what that would look like, right? Uh, how would you conduct an interview process that would 
be designed around identifying those characteristics? Um, well, I don't think we, we yet have the textbook on, on, on how to do that. And I'm sure we'll, but I, we, the first thing we say is that we, we need those sorts of interviews. We need to assess those sorts of capabilities. We do make some suggestions. Um, so I think, um, uh, um, I, I, a company that actually does this is, is, is Alibaba. So Alibaba hires people not on change tolerance. They hire people on, on, on love of change. Um, so the questions that they are asking indirectly are essentially, um, uh, you know, have you, have you experienced change and, and did you, did it energize you? Were you able to take the change as a sort of a, a, a liberation, a possibility to in, embrace, uh, embrace new ways of thinking? If you talk to people about what they've done, um, you will see that there are very different types with respect to that. You know, there's some of us are more oriented towards optimizing, uh, what is others, you know, following, following rules and conventions as to what is and. And, and others, um, you know, challenging what is and, and, and inventing new ways of thinking. Um, now we may have different problems if everyone were like that, but, um, but we certainly need more people in large corporations to, uh, to, to, to be like that. And that is a bit of a problem because if you think about it, um, to this traditional concept of a large organization, which is, you know, optimizing the, uh, yesterday's successful business model, which undoubtedly needs to occur because that's where the cash comes from to pay for the future growth. Um, it tends to be associated with the notion that the person with the biggest P and L, the person with the biggest historic contribution, the person with the biggest organization is the most important. And if you have mavericks in your organization that are the future seeds of hope, um, essentially they need to feel, uh, recognized. They need to feel and actually to be, uh, to, to be heard. So it's also an issue of, 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 of corporate culture. You need those first people in the, you need those, those people in the first place. And you also need an environment where their type of contribution can be, uh, can be recognized. Well, it seems very difficult though, if you have a legacy organization where you haven't been hiring for those attributes, uh, and most of the people that you have in the organization are, are not, you know, resistant to learning or, uh, not, not have not been incentivized for decades on, on questioning their mental models. Uh, if you're a leader in that organization, how do you, how do you, reorient the organization is there is there a way that you can kind of you know wall off the 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 harmful elements and and just create a whole new division or do you try to change those people in in some way uh, uh, you know um because ultimately if if you if you can't change them then whatever new mavericks you you bring in they're they're just going to get they're they're just going to get frustrated and and defeated and and they're going to they're going to leave well well i think um there, there are different strategies that are successful under different circumstances to achieve, um, to achieve this ambidexterity. When I say ambidexterity, I don't mean, I mean, not just ambidexterity of externals, you know, things that we do, but ambidexterity of internals, things that we, ways of thinking. And, um, so one strategy is probably the simplest strategy is separation, um, uh, which is one you're just referring to, which is, uh, you simply say, well, let's have, um, you know, let's have the new unit and the, and the old unit and you. They don't have to completely harmonize and, um, um, because of course we know that the, everybody being ambidextrous is a, is a, is a hopelessly unrealistic dream. We, we know, we know from sort of, um, neuroscience that we, you know, we're never all going to have that profile. It's improbable that we're going to hire an organization where everybody can be a poet, a poet and an accountant at the, at the same time. So separation, but separation has, um, has some costs associated with it. You know, one of them is that, um, uh, you know, if you do discover the new in the new unit, um, you know, how do you take resources away from the, the previously successful and, and pull it towards the prospectively successful? You know, we know that resource allocation is not a, not a trivial thing in that respect. Um, the second alternative is, um, is, um, what we call switching, which is you actually do have ambidextrous teams and, um, and the focus of the team, you know, starts off more creative. And, um, and counterfactual and becomes more, uh, more, uh, you know, engineering like over, over, over time. Um, uh, that's hard to do. Uh, you wouldn't do that just for the sake of it, but you might have to do that if you're in a business where your product life cycles progress very rapidly. So you don't have these sort of messy reintegration problems. So Corning Glass is a good example of a, of a company that tries to achieve the sort of contextual ambidexterity. 
And then the third alternative is um, the alternative of the, of the internal ecosystem, where you you see the company as um, simply the playing field upon which uh, different diverse approaches um, can can apply. And the role of management is to is to keep score across these um, competing micro business units. So the company becomes an internal marketplace. So and Hire, the Chinese white goods company, is a very good example of that. And then the example that was um, you know, rare 10 years ago, uh, the, is the digital external, um, uh, ecosystem. So, um, 10 years ago, um, none of the world's 10 largest companies, uh, was, was, was a digital, um, external ecosystem. Now seven of the world's 10 largest companies 10 years later, are uh, digital, um, ec- ecosystems, the huge, um, huge change in business, uh, that changes the whole concept of strategy because the question now becomes not, um, you know, how do I construct a competitively successful company? It becomes, how do I create a successful position within a successful ecosystem? So the unit of analysis, organizationally speaking, uh, changes. And that's quite a useful way of, um, that's quite a useful strategy because uh, you don't necessarily have to have all of the capabilities that we're talking about here yourself. You just have to have a reason for other people to join a club uh, that collectively and uh, has, has 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 those capabilities. So the one that's really massively on the rise is this external ecosystems based approach. But there are four approaches, each of which are optimal under different circumstances. I think. Uh, so you, you mentioned um, how important it is for people to have um, sort of a Renaissance perspective, right? Ideally, have uh, some familiarity with the humanities, some familiarity with the sciences. You know, you point to Goethe as your your <laughs> kind of ideal last Renaissance man. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to recruit too many Gotas to, to work in, in our, in our companies. Um, it, you know, <laughs> but, um, I mean, would you encourage people as individuals, as part of their career journey to, um, to look to someone like a Gota as, as more of a, a role model than, than someone who is more narrow in their perspective to be in business? Or would you, would you simply encourage them to, uh, outsource this by, joining a team that is, that is diverse, that has lots of diverse perspectives, uh, that's cognitively diverse, that brings different things to the table. And as a company, is it better to hire a dozen Goethe's or is it better to hire, you know, a couple who are good at optics and a couple who are good at poetry and a couple who are, you know, good at all the other, uh, botany and all the other things that Goethe was good at and, and then, and have them work it out in a room. Um, well, I think, um, cognitive diversity is, is good at, at an individual level. If you want to diversify the risk in your career. Um, you know, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, and, um, or, or another way of putting it is, you know, invest in meta learning, invest in learning skills rather than having learned a particular thing. Um, and, you know, familiarity with multiple disciplines, you know, even if it's just two, but two or three or four or five, uh, just expands your repertoire of ways of thinking about things. So that's valuable at, at, at an individual level. And we're now in a situation where, um, the, uh, it, it's extremely unlikely that anyone can build a career by being good at one thing. So the idea of rising through the ranks, um, you know, staying with one company, with one business model and trading on your expertise is extremely unlikely in, in, in almost any business I can, I, I can think about. So this really is a, you know, widespread need for us individually to uh, diversify, um, uh, our, our, our talents. Um, now, of course, as you said, there are limits to that. So we're not going to be able to hire too many Goethe's and in which case we need, we also need to focus on ambidextrous teams. Um, so especially anyone in a position of leadership wants to make sure that their, their team doesn't become too much oriented to optimizing yesterday's business model. Um, you know, so you have the, the engineering and the, uh, and the finance associated with, you know, fine tuning yesterday's business model, that's a, that's a valuable thing. Um, but it doesn't, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't set up for the inevitable possibility that that will need to be uh, reinvented uh, at, at some point. So you need those skills on the team. You need those conversations in advance of having the, the urgent need to reinvent your business. So that, that in itself, uh, I think, feeds in then um, to, to, I think, the final chapter of the book, which is the, the, the chapter on leadership, which is what, the, what is the role of leaders in all of this? Um, well, a leader can set the um, cultural context, you know, which is a, they can legitimize this exploration activity. They can hire the diversity of skills that you're going to need, not just to run a business, but to, uh, but to, but, 
but to reinvent a business. They can make sure that they have um, ambidextrous um, uh, top teams. Um, they may not, they may not be able to um, be always able to give good prescriptions in fast changing businesses, but they can have very good questions. They can signal a lot in the art of asking um, ask, ask, asking the right questions, and also they can um, um, create this optimal sense of urgency that we talked about in terms of the tone and the and the, and the comfort of the organization. And um, and also they can um, uh, modulate the the degree of metabolism of the organization because one another thing of, that, that gets in the way of much of what we've talked about is um, too much too much static complexity. I mean, large organizations are complex and that complexity is often uh, static. Uh, whereas, uh, for instance, come back to Alibaba, one of the things they believe is that all aspects of the organization um, should be adapting to changing market circumstances at all times. And they explicitly say that um, sometimes it may be, they say that the, de the default is change. And sometimes that means changing if there's no reason to. And they recognize that that may come at the expense of efficiency, but they think the long-term cost of losing fluidity is, is even greater. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're constantly investing in, uh, in, in, in change and they can, they can de-risk that by having the, the grain size of the change be quite small. So they're never betting the shop by changing anything that they're, uh, they're constantly changing things in small ways and by also, uh, making change reversible, making it about change options rather than, um, you know, wholesale, uh, overall, uh, livable, um, uh, in, in as many cases as, 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 as possible. So I, I think pretty much every business leader I've spoken to, uh, believes that cognitive diversity is important. And, and certainly there's a, there's a lot of, you know, HR departments have embraced the idea of, of, of diversity, but is something lost in translation by the time it gets down to, to the HR department, our, our, our companies, um, you know, under, do they understand at the recruiting level what, what this means, cognitive diversity? Um, well, I think um, diversity is a big thing in business. We talk about it a lot. Um, we talk about it mainly in, in um, relation to protected characteristics. And um, so I think there are widespread, large-scale, sincere efforts on that front. I would observe that we haven't made that much progress on, you know, for, for the volume of verbiage on the topic or progress has been surprisingly slow especially in the middle of organizations. A lot of companies have increased their recruiting diversity and they've managed to get a certain level of diversity in, the, in, in top teams, even if it, 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 it is short, short of, uh, say, gender parity. Um, uh, but in the middle of the organizations, remarkably slow, slow progress, frustrating slow pro process. Um, and then I think cognitive diversity is a little different. Um, I don't think we... Um, I don't think, I don't think we have widespread agreement on how to measure cognitive diversity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, lots of, um, uh, uh lo lots of testing for diversity, cognitive diversity in businesses mm -hmm. based upon psychology, per, you know, personality assessments, which is mm -hmm. in many cases, the self perception of, um, of, of psychological traits. Um, I think the evidence says that, um, neuroscience based assessment, uh, which is a different school of thought, um, it's more, it's, it's less my perception of my own personality than, uh, my, my cognitive abilities as measured by, uh, by sort of neuroscience, uh, uh games and tests, uh, that, that has a much higher predictive value. Um, so in the, um, in the, what we talk about a company called, um, um, uh, called Pymetrics, which is a, an MIT, um, uh, spin out that has combined, um, uh, machine learning with, with neuroscience testing for the purpose of creating uh, more predictive measures of, 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 of neurodiversity. And I, I don't think it's yet the case that this is the norm in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in HR, in, in HR departments. I think the, the last, in the last chapter, you talk about corporate scripts and how important it is for leaders to, um, design a corporate script. Um, we see companies like Amazon and Facebook and, and Google with kind of corporate mission statements, or, you know, in the case of Amazon, they have the 14 characteristics that they, you know, they believe to be kind of the defining principles of, of, a, of an Amazonian. Um, and you argue that these things can't be too, too complex and they can't be too, too simple. Um, what, what would be a, an example, or what would it look like to have one of these corporate scripts that would maximize the amount of 
counterfactual thinking of learning of um, uh, ambidextrousness that, that you would want to see in an organization. Right. So you're referring to, to steps five and, and, and six in our six step framework. Yeah. So the step five says that codification may sound like the opposite of uh, imagination. You're writing the SIP for the new offering, what can be less imaginative. In fact, it, um, it's, it's not such an easy thing. It requires a different type of imagination to say of the thousands of things we could, we could talk about in relation to the new innovation, you know, having employees aware of these five critical things is, 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 is the, is the heart of it. And, and communicating, communicating, communicating that precisely enough that it is mm -hmm. um, able to replicate the, uh, the good effect of the new offering, but not so tightly that it, it, um, it undermines customization and, and evolvability. Um, so, so that's, um, you know, that's a very important part of, um, imagination later in the cycle, uh, where you, where you're trying to sort of codify and replicate success, uh, involving people that were not involved in the original, uh, in the original context. And, um, so that was some of the more interesting chapters to write, to look at how companies had, had, had codified, um, mm -hmm. uh, different, uh, different innovations. And then there is the, 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 the meta codification, if you like, of the way of, um, conceiving new ideas and codifying new ideas and being ambidextrous on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, so the, re the reason we think this is important is that without that ability to exploit the fruits of imagination, there'll be no funding of new imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that's, you know, that's, that's important. And also every company will, um, will need to do this multiple times in its life cycle. So it's very important that this is a repeatable capability, which is, you know, pre preemptively prepared. So you could call this the, the, the innovation operating system of the enterprise, if you like, it's very important to, to name what it is and to, uh, and to make it fit for purpose and also to, uh, evolve the, uh, evolve, evolve the system at that, uh, at, at that level. And, you know, you, you, you need a couple of characteristics in there. You need. Um, you need a, you need a system. So to the, speaking about the innovation system and codification of that, I think there are different ways of getting the job done, but you need essentially the possibility of each of the stages that we've talked about today to be, uh, to be viable. So, um, you need the stage of observing anomalous signals to be, uh, to, to, to be viable. And that involves a bunch of things that we've already spoken about, you know, spending time on that, being externally oriented and so on. You need the reflection time. You need step two, you need the. You need to, um, celebrate reflection, show that it's an important part of the job, train, train, train people how to, how to do that. You need the, um, you need in a, a sufficient, a sufficient volume of experimentation, um, in stage three that we call the collision, which is where you collide ideas with the reality, not only to see whether they're valid or not, but also to generate new, new surprises and insights. Um, you need, um, the communication of insights so that, um, insights become shared, you know, my, a. If, if money ideas doesn't travel in an organization and many large organizations have very powerful barriers to prevent communication and common language around, um, early stage ideas, um, without that, it remains, um, you know, a, 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 a private hobby or, um, or, or, or a fantasy. So there has to be collective, uh, alignment and amplification of a, 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 an, e an evolution of ideas, uh, the codification step, and then the self disruption at the end of the cycle to say, let's you know, let, let's do it again, which we know is a tremendously hard thing. We know that, um, companies that are able to do that. You call this er erasing this, erasing the script, right? After which you... is, which is about it, which is about erasing the script or disrupt or, or disrupting the script or allowing plurality in the script, you know, not, not, not taking the final 5% of the optimization to eliminate all variants whatsoever. Um, so, 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 you know, I think this is a, a very, um, high order necessary leadership trait in, to, in, in, in today's business environment. Well, I think all those steps are, um, very well articulated in the book. And in addition to discussing them, you ground them in psychology, you ground them in, in biology, you ground them in philosophy. Um, you also provide, um, readers with, uh, a bunch of different exercises that they can do within their own organizations. And also you provide diagnostics, which allow them to evaluate kind of where their organization is uh, along this journey. So Martin, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. The book is, uh, imagination machine co-authored with, with Jack Fuller. Um, and of course there's your strategy needs a strategy, which is also, 
Um, a great book uh, to check out. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.